Hello, 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 everybody. Let's go live again. This is the great Johannes speaking. Johannes Matthias Conrad in Dutch. Johannes Matthijs Conrad. You know, I'm a Dutchman speaking in English. I learned to speak English as a kid, you know, watching uh, Sky Channel with Linda the Mole and DJ the Cat in the 1980s. You had, we had our Inspector Gadget, G.I. Joe, Transformers. <laughs> uh, I suppose you still have those today uh, in different uh, renewed versions of them. So as people are coming into the live chat, I'm going to talk about some topics that I uh, lined up. Uh, first thing I want to mention is uh, Tucker Carlson called Alex Jones uh, uh, some kind of a genius, like a prophet, because apparently before the 9-11 attacks happened, you know, the attacks in New York City with the Twin Towers and the planes that allegedly went through those buildings, um, Alex Jones is this uh, American conspiracy theorist, quote unquote. I never heard of him before the 2016 Trump elections. Uh, it was really through that process of uh, Trump winning the election that Alex Jones also became very popular, uh, at least outside of the USA, because I live in Europe, right? And so how did he do it? Tucker Carlson interviewed Alex Jones for one and a half hour. I watched only a part of the interview. He does say a lot of things that the elites are actually doing, but here's the thing. How come Alex Jones predicted so far, you know, in the same year, like months ahead, like almost a year ahead, that Osama bin Laden, the uh, Saudi terrorist hiding in the in the in the caves of Tora Bora in, in, in Afghanistan, was somehow going to be involved in 9/11 when we now all know that uh, the twin towers were down with controlled expo uh, controlled demolition with planned explosives. That means T Tucker, if Tucker Carlson still believes the narrative that the buildings were blown up by Osama bin Laden, that means several things. Uh, it means Tucker Carlson is not on our side. If Tucker Carlson still believes that uh, the Twin Towers were taken down by, uh, by planes rather than it was uh, basically with the, done with explosives, like an internal affair, right? an inside job, then we know that Tucker Carlson is himself a Secret Service asset. I assume he's with the CIA. We also know that Alex Jones didn't predict that Osama bin Laden was going to be involved in, a, in an attack that was not performed by Osama bin Laden, but by the U.S. The United States did it to themselves. They murdered their own people. 3,000 or more of their own people were killed in that building. When the buildings, when the Twin Towers collapsed. So we know that Alex Jones is rather not a visionary, not a seer, not a prophet at all. Alex Jones is also an intelligence asset. Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson both work for the CIA. And in particular, Alex Jones's job was to insert himself into the truther movement that everybody could predict was going to arrive after the Twin Tower attacks, after 9-11-2001. And so Alex Jones's job was to insert himself into the truther movement and then start talking about gay frogs and aliens and whatever. And in one way to uh, discredit the truther movement, like, well, if you think if you think 9-11 was an inside job, you also believe in aliens and you believe in gay frogs. So like that. Right. But also Alex Jones's role nowadays is more of. Uh, preparing people for what is coming next for the transgenderism and the veganism. So he warns you for things that will happen because the elites are really doing these things. But Alex Jones doesn't actually care about stopping you. He wants to, this is called backlashing. Backlashing means you, you get people to get angry about something up front so that by the time they're going to get screwed, they're no longer angry and they will passively submit to, to the screwing. Right? So, but let's talk about some other things as well. Uh, today's Friday, December 8th. So I suppose uh, people are going out and not everybody's going to be watching my show, but I, uh, I like to do these shows also to practice my speaking, right? So it's always, I always have a dual purpose for everything that I do. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention up front before, I'm going to talk about the Nord Stream most of the time during this, uh, this session. I'm going to do uh, live streams for about an hour at a time every day in the evenings here in Europe. Kim Dotcon uh, found a video of uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who is a Hungarian Jew. And Blinken said he called 600,000 dead Ukrainians in this 
U.S. proxy war against Russia a win-win situation for U.S. weapons manufacturers. In fact, I put a clip of this on my TikTok. He really said something like this. He said that um, the war in Ukraine has been greatly beneficial to the U.S. economy. You've grown jobs. And therefore, he says, we must continue it. He, he wants to continue the war of sending Europeans to die against, against Russians because it makes them money. It makes the U.S. weapons manufacturers money, but also the U.S. Uh, security system that involves the spying and whatever, all of it included. They made a lot of money off of this war. So he wants it to go on. Clearly, he openly said that the plan is to sacrifice Europe for as long as the U.S. can make money off of sacrificing Europe in war. I take a particular interest in such statements, and I will not forget the name Anthony Blinken. Right. So the U.S. produced jobs and more economic growth, blah, blah. And we need to continue that. Here is uh, the tweet from Kim.com. I can't show stuff on screen anymore because TikTok will sometimes uh, flag my live shows when I show videos. So if I wanted to show you the video of Blinken saying this, my, I might actually get suspended from my live show. But if I just talk without showing you the footage, uh, then uh, then I get away with it. So. Consider this live stream more something like a radio show where you watch me talk while I do the radio show, right? So, uh, oh, someone shared the live. Well, thank you for sharing the live show. Um, and so the United States clearly is the enemy of Europe. This should be clear to everybody living in Europe. The U.S. is not our friend. They just want to make money, keep growing their economy, stay powerful, because after all, the United States pays for the security of Israel and the United States makes most money off of the European market outside of the US. The Europe is the European Union is the biggest market for the USA, right? Uh, they sell us their products, their goods, their their culture, their Hollywood movies, their Starbucks, their McDonald's, their Nikes. They sell us all this stuff. So they don't want to lose, especially Western Europe. This is also why the US doesn't mind mass immigration into Europe. It means more customers for Starbucks, right? That's how they see everything. They don't care about us at all. They see Europe merely uh, not even as human beings. They don't, they don't even see us as human beings. They see us merely as an opportunity to make money. Whether or not, you know, sometimes you can make money by burning down a forest, right? And that's what Europe is to the American, to the Americans. If they can burn down Europe for a dollar, they'll burn down Europe for a dollar. These are not our friends. And I'm talking about the leadership. I understand that the American people are very well innocent. All the people are innocent, but the leaders are not. And we need to make it very clear to us. We cannot accept this American leadership to continue ruining Europe, destroying Europe, right? And then expecting what? Expecting us to march along like a stupid bunch of lemmings on our way to die in war against Russia? No. Dead Ukrainians are simply an income stream to the USA. That's what Kim.com says. And I repeated this sentiment in the TikTok video I make. You can watch my TikTok videos on uh, here. Well, you're on my TikTok at, uh, at the great Johannes, you know. Right here, John D. Moore, John D. Moore said, uh, the USA, they're not the friend of their own citizens either. And of course not. The American leadership is, is just out to make money. These elite capitalists, corporatists, you know, multinational shareholders. They don't give a damn about humanity. They only care about money and about thinking of new ways to squeeze more money out of people or more labor time or labor energy out of people, all in their own benefit. It's really disgusting, you know. But I wanted to talk about something. There's a, a couple of Russian prankers who make regular prank calls to high ranking European officials. Uh, for example, they they managed to get through to Zelensky at one point of Ukraine, right? They also spoke to Christine Lagarde of the European Central Bank, and they asked her all, <clears throat> all sorts of questions about what the uh, what the policy, what the real policy was, right? Like off the record, and they spoke to German Foreign Minister Robert Habeck, who turns out that even on the phone, when he thought he was speaking to uh, the leader of the African Union, he still is just an actor he's an employee none of these lead what, what these prank calls reveal is that none of the european leaders are actually thinking men or women they don't use their brains to do their own thinking rather they are told what to do by their bosses so the foreign ministers of europe are not actually in charge of the foreign policy of europe of their nations they simply are employees working for presumably brussels 
from where they take their orders. They are simply told what to do. They are managers, in a sense, not ministers. That's a big difference. Unlike, for example, uh, the Russian foreign minister Lavrov, who is clearly a very intelligent, high IQ man, knowledgeable, who also believes in what they're trying to do with Russia. N none of the people in Europe, none of the foreign ministers in Europe believes in what they're doing. Right. It, it's just really absurd. Uh, someone writes that need that American elite leadership like a moose needs a hat rack. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. And so our European leaders are fake. They're frauds. I call them script fed actors. They receive in the mornings or in their briefings or on the, in their email, perhaps they receive. Hey, these are your talking points for today. This is what you must tell the people. This is what you must tell foreign leaders. Sometimes you tell them different things. Right. And, and that's how they are. You know, it's just totally fake. But so these Russian pranksters, they're called Vovan and Lexus. And although I heard a clip of them for just a minute and they speak with a very thick Slavic accent, they speak English, right? But with a very, very thick Slavic accent, the way I'm speaking with my Dutch accent. And, and it's just so weird uh, that our European leaders do not have the cultural knowledge or the intelligence to sense that, hey, wait a minute, if someone pretends to be the leader of the African Union, but they speak to me in a thick Slavic accent. How is that possible? It means that our leaders in Europe, foreign ministers, foreign ministers cannot hear the difference between someone speaking with a Slavic accent, with a Arabic accent or with a German accent. They can't hear it because they are not culturally educated people. They are dumb asses who should not be allowed to work at these high levels of office at all. Um, you need some level of linguistic expertise if you're a foreign minister you don't have to speak 12 languages but you should be able to figure out who is from where based on their accents oh you're from arabia or you're from russia right you know this is nonsense so these prankers vovan and lexus uh i've got an article here let's see so the norwegian prime minister is called gar Sture. gar Sture. i can't pronounce it very well because i don't speak norwegian but um, they, they managed to get through to the Norwegian prime minister and asked him questions about Nord Stream pipelines uh, explosion because the theory is, according to uh, Seymour Hirsch, the journalist who figured this all out, and I think it is the truth, the truth theory, the truth, um, is that Seymour Hirsch figured out that the Norwegians, Norwegian divers, helped the Americans uh, pull off the stunt. Although mostly uh, what I know is that mostly American vessels and vehicles will, were used. Uh, American planes, for example, and American uh, ships at sea were used. But the divers were likely uh, working together with Americans. So there were Norwegian divers and uh, uh, divers from a, a special outfit in Florida, USA. Anyway, why Norwegian divers? Well, for two reasons. Why would Norway be involved? Uh, uh, the first reason is Norway has a lot of oil platforms out at sea. So Norway has highly trained deep divers for those uh, drilling uh, operations. Uh, and so the United States could, was in need of such diver expertise. But secondly, secondly, Norway itself has a lot of oil and gas to sell. So if you could bomb the Nord Stream pipeline and shut off Europe's connection or the German industry's connection to uh, Russia and the Yamal pipeline and the Turk stream and so on, because uh, there are many pipelines. There's Nord Stream 1 and 2, and then there's the Yamal, then there's the Yamal runs through Ukraine over, over land, and then you have the Turk stream that runs through Turkey over land. Uh, and there are many more, uh, but these are some big ones. All of them are, are either have been shut down or bombed or sabotaged or are uh, are being questioned whether they ought to be shot down, shot down, because the Ukrainian army is actually looking to destroy the Turk stream pipeline as well. Uh, although, although the United States threw Ukraine under the bus for Nord Stream, saying that, oh, well, Ukraine did it. No, the Americans did it with the Norwegian, with the help of the Norwegians. But Norway, because they can could then sell oil to Europe and make a lot of money. And that may, may make even more <clears throat> makes even more sense if you knew that uh, when Norway struck gold, you know, they purchased they purchased this oil field off of Denmark for a bottle of wine or something or a bottle of champagne, which they never opened, by the way. They still have that bottle. 
and now they're making billions and billions, like 500 billions in oil profits or something like that, right? And so Norway is an extremely wealthy country per capita and uh, as a nation as well. Uh, and the Norwegians put a lot of that money, they invested it in, guess where they invested it? What do you do with $500 billion when you have it? Well, the Norwegians decided that it was their best idea to invest all that money in the U.S. economy. They invested in whatever, you know, Enron and uh, whatever, you name it. They invested in a lot of U.S. companies like uh, the banks as well. I forgot their names. Like uh, what's it called? Bernie Mac and something. No, these names and um, there were several banks in the U.S. that they invested in. Some of those banks actually collapsed afterwards. So they lost their money. They lost a ton of money. So the Norwegians are investing in the U.S. economy, and so Norway then ends up being the slave of the U.S. They have to support U.S. policy. They have to support every policy that benefits the U.S. because it benefits Norway due to the investments. This is the problem with investment. You become attached to it, right? You are no longer independent, especially if you put all your money in, in one fund, then you're attached to it, you know? So Norway has committed an act of treason against the European family. And although the Norwegian people are innocent, yeah, they're always innocent, the Norwegian leadership, the elites, the ruling families there, the nobility, they have nobility, the blue bloods, the aristocracy of Norway is most certainly not innocent and they will have to be dealt with at some point because you do not betray Europe like this where you think you can attack your brothers, your European brothers, you know, blow up the Nord Stream, harm all Europeans, increase our heating costs by from 100 euros a month to 400 euros a month or more. Some people are paying 1,000 euros a month now when they were, were paying 50 euros before, right? And then you think you're going to get away with that? No. I think I'm going to sneeze for a moment, or maybe not, you know, whatever. Sometimes you think you're going to sneeze, and then it doesn't happen. Weird, huh? All Europeans are brothers, yes, but Norway is a traitor. The Norwegian brother is going to have to pay for something. You will have to pay by giving Europe a very, very, very highly discounted access to your oil and gas reserves because you screwed us, you screwed your European, your European family, and unless you are thinking of cutting Norway out of Scandinavia and shipping it over to the US so you can sleep with your, with your daddy there, uh, if you're going to stay here in Europe, you're going to have to pay for it. And I, like I said, the, European pe uh, the Norwegian people are innocent, but the leadership is extremely, extremely treasonous and traitorous. You have harmed Europe, you will pay for it. You know, I'm just making it very clear how this stuff is going to work out because these these kinds of things, the normal people will never understand that you can keep lying about it on the media. Even your prime minister will lie on a, lie about it on a prank call with, with some Russian pranksters. But I know, and lots of people know. We know what you did. You know. Yeah, heating is getting very expensive in Europe. Hungary is one of the few countries that actually subsidizes people's heating costs nowadays. The government actually pays for it, largely. And so these Russian pranksters, they made a phone call. Damn it, I, do, I keep feeling like I need to sneeze, uh, sneeze and it doesn't happen. That's really annoying. You know? Just a minute. <clears throat> Just in the middle of a live show, of course, right? you get this, ah, this weird sensation. All right. So Gar Störe, Störe, Gar Störe is the name of the Norwegian prime minister. And he spoke uh, about the Nord Stream, but of course he denied everything. And he said, no, Seymour Hersh's article is full of mistakes. Really name one, I couldn't name one, right? Uh, it's like that. Uh, the Norwegian prime minister also, he himself is not guilty of this. He's an employee. I figured this out by now that all these older men in their 60s who, who are like prime minister or director of the... You know, like, like Christine Lagarde, older woman, director of the European Central Bank. You think they are these competent, greatly skilled people. But the only thing they are really good at is lying and deceiving people. They are script-fed actors who feel nothing for the words that they speak. You know, when I speak, when I, when I speak my videos, I tend to mean what I say, you know. Sometimes I have ulterior motives where I want people to understand something. But I, I wouldn't be, I'm not an actor lying about everything right and that's what these people are these bureaucrats these politicians they are systemic liars who will lie 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 merely because they want people to like them or they want to feel 
that they have status or something or authority. They have none of these things anyway, not naturally at least, but they want it so badly they are willing to, to, lie, to lie about everything for a basic pay of what, $100,000 a year. Because in Europe, our politicians, they don't get paid much. In the Netherlands, I think they make 80,000 a year and they think that's a lot of money. These people would sell their entire people to a foreigner, to a foreign entity for $80,000 a year. It's that insane, you know? So, you know, I still think uh, we should talk more about Nord Stream. I have said before that this was uh, an act of war by the United States against the European people and against the European Union and against Germany, against German industry and against basically, you know, all the European nations, except for Norway, because Norway is a traitor. Yeah, and you, we can keep beating about the bush for over this. We can keep, you know, lying about it and pretending it didn't happen. But this is, I believe, the beginning of the end of the relationship between Europe and the United States. This is the moment when the Europeans realize, you know, uh, we're going to have to cut loose from the USA because Europe does not exist merely to sacrifice itself so that we can save the US economy or that the US can keep making money off of us while off of us while we send tens of millions of European men to die against Russia or, or some other war. No, we're not going to sacrifice Europe just to save the USA. Europe is going to become strong again. We have 700 million people in Europe, 740 million people. Most of them are white people, 700 million white people, right? Compared to the US population, which is about half of that. I've said it before that Europe has almost three times as many white people as the USA does. Now, of course, you've got Canada as well, and you've got whatever, right? But the thing is, Europe is our homeland. We are not going to sacrifice Europe to save the US, nor should we sacrifice the US middle class just to save Israel, because that's also happening, right? Israel is that other dimension in this story. They're sacrificing Europe for the US, but the US for Israel. In the end, it's all about Israel again, right? We, we got to stop this, you know. You know, someone asks, is the Netherlands okay with the Geert Wilders? You know, Israel reigned in the Netherlands. No, of course not. The Netherlands, Geert Wilders is a, is a controlled opposition. He's going to, you know, either send men to war in defense of Israel or he's going to just uh, strip the, the native Dutch middle class off of, its, off of its savings, you know, to save Israel. This guy's loyalty is not with us, you know. Someone wants to move to Europe, really? Yeah, we're going to make a stand here. My idea is that Europe has the potential within it still. After all that went wrong, First World War, Second World War, we still carry within us the potential, the spiritual energy to, to rise like the phoenix from the ashes, so to speak, so that we can become, uh, you know, our strongest version of ourselves, regardless of what the world thinks of us, right? And we have options. I've spoken about this too. Europe has the, the, can make the choice to keep supporting the U.S. while we are destroying ourselves. You know, this is like a relationship where uh, one, one member of the relationship, you know, is, is getting beaten and their lives are getting worse and worse. And the other person is very abusive. And it happens to be so that the, Europe is taking the abuse nowadays. But we don't have to do this. We, are, we actually have options. We can get the hell out of here. We can work with, uh, we can have diplomatic ties with Russia, for example, Right or with the Arab world, I prefer I prefer the Christian Russian world to the Muslim Arab world, obviously. But we have options that the U.S. doesn't have. The U.S. has only one option, that is to sacrifice Europe to save itself. Europe has many more options. One of them being simply cutting loose from the USA. You know. So uh, I was reading this article from the Brussels Times. This is about, let's see. Uh, yeah, you know, Seymour Hirsch is this uh, journalist who disclosed or uncovered really that the Americans had done the Nord Stream. Because, you know, the Americans tried to blame Russia. Remember that? Right after the bombings, they tried to blame Russia. No one believed it. The world didn't believe it. And then they, now, they're, now they're blaming Ukraine. They're throwing Ukraine under the bus. But Ukraine doesn't have the skills to do it. The Norwegian divers and the Florida divers did. And the U.S. leadership did it. They, they even announced it. Biden literally announced it. So what would you expect, you know? 
You know, Seymour Hirsch wrote several articles on how and why the U.S. blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, let me just maybe quote some things from this and just go over it a little bit. Because I think this is just such a crucial moment in the history of the relationship between the U.S. and, uh, uh, and Europe. Namely that, like I said, it's the beginning of the end of the relationship between the U.S. and Europe. This just can't go on, you know. Yeah, Wilders has the Israeli flag in his office, yeah. You know, and never forget what Undersecretary Victoria Nuland said. Fuck the EU, yeah, yeah. She's not a pleasant person. No. Women like Victoria Nuland are deeply involved in the actual strategy of the United States. Uh, they really design, uh, they design the foreign policy to a large extent, or they're, they're at least involved in it. You know, they're, these people and she's Jewish, these people care only for that, that weird dream of an Israel, such a small country with so few people, yet they think that's the most important thing in the whole world. But of course, if you're not Jewish, you're not you know, Zionist or Israeli, you know, if you're from Europe, I don't want to see people sacrifice Europe just because the majority of European people are normies who don't know, uh, who, who are not aware of what's going on because they watch the news. Get it? They watch TV, they watch the news. So all the information they get is a totally artificial fake reality and they don't see through it. You have to start turning off the TV to start seeing more of the reality. Uh, is this guy a Lars Fredrickson fan? Well, let me, people always throw names at me and I've never heard of them. Lars Fredrickson. Lars Fredrickson, you know, is an American musician and record producer. Never heard of him, you know. See, I don't know everything. Okay. So, Seymour Hirsch, you know, am I a Freemason? <laughs> Freemasonry is basically Judaism for non-Jews. No, I'm not a member of that. Freemasonry is like ancient Egyptian occultism for Europeans, but it's heavily influenced by Jewish thought and Kabbalism, basically. And what they do is they they organize mock deaths and mock killings of their members so that they introduce you into the secrecy. It's a secrecy cult. The cult itself is not secret, but you learn about how to keep things a secret. And this is why I think so many politicians and upper people, you know, politicians and, and um, uh, bureaucrats are, are members of the Freemasonry because they have their old boys networks where they can commit crimes and then keep quiet about it, right? Israel is an outpost of the USA. Downright it is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Freemasonry. Look into the Rosicrucians. They are behind the worker movements. They always believe that you could elevate the working classes, right? Uh, and really, they're also just also an occult group again, similar to the Freemasons. I'm going to quote some lines from... Uh, uh, Seymour Hersh's article. He wrote this one last year, I think. So the U.S. Navy's Diving and Salvage Center can be found in a location as obscure as its name, down what was once a country lane in rural Panama City, a now booming resort city in the southwestern panhandle of Florida, 70, 70 miles south of the Alabama border. The center's complex is as nondescript as its location, a drab concrete post-war World War II structure that has the look of a vocational high school on the west side of Chicago. All right. So he describes it all. And then he goes into like, it's called the Bolt Ops NATO exercise. Oh, that's how they did it. You know, remember there was a NATO exercise in the Baltic Sea, Bolt Ops 22, 2022. And, and this is how they very often do it. If you pay attention to how these terrorist attacks happen, they always happen after an exercise. During 9-11, the U.S. Army, the Air Force was also doing military exercises. So everything was scrambled. Everybody was preoccupied doing something else. And then the real thing happened and nobody knew what was going on. Right. And then uh, the same thing, they do that with terrorist attacks. For example, if you want to pull off a terrorist attack on, say, a ferry, a ship, how do you do it? Well, you wait, you wait, you wait until there is a normal planned maintenance period and then during the maintenance of the ship you install 
remote detonatable bombs on board during the maintenance. So then when the maintenance is finished, no one suspects there will be bombs on board. The ship just had maintenance. And <laughs> I saw some spit flying. You know, and then, because it's remotely detonatable, whenever you want, you detonate it, say three months later or six months later or weeks later. That's how I also think they did the downing of flight MH17, the one from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur that crashed before the border of Russia. Two weeks before the plane crashed, it had it maintenance. It had a maintenance period. So you, you can imagine how they do it. They send in their, their working, they have their, uh, their secret servicemen dressed up as technicians. They come in for a final inspection. And during the final inspection, they plant bombs on board of the plane, remote detonatable bombs. And so whenever the plane then reaches the destination where you want it to blow up, you can then via satellite send a, uh, send a signal to have it blow up. And this is how I also think they did um, the, bolt, uh, the, the, the explosion of, uh, of Nord Stream. Uh, with Nord Stream, they use a sort of thing called a sono buoy. That's a buoy that floats on the surface of the sea, but it sends a sound signal all the way down to the surface. And these sono buoys can be used then to send signals to detonate a remote detonatable bomb system. So the Norwegian divers working with the uh, Florida divers, they planted the bombs and then later uh, they probably planted them during the Balt Ops uh, NATO exercise in the Baltic Sea. Right. So nobody suspects anything. Oh, it's just normal exercise. And then later you have uh, a helicopter or a plane fly by activating the sauna boy. And then the sauna boy sends the signal down to the ocean floor where the pipelines have been rigged with explosives. It turns out that one of the pipelines did not blow up because the explosives weren't powerful enough. And that's very interesting because they were. And then the, and then the German government decides to shut down that still working pipeline anyway and refuse, refuses to use it, selling their population up with extreme, you know, heating costs. You know? Uh, someone says that NASA apparently owns 90% of helium on Earth. Really? The satellites on helium balloons. Okay, that's funny. I don't know why. why I don't know if I believe that, but, you know. Sounds like Alex Jones. There were no Chinese spy balloons in the USA. Those were, those were actual hobby weather balloons by hobbyists who sent them up in space. These people were totally embarrassed that the U.S. Uh, Air Force actually flew by in their jets to scramble these. It's just hobby balloons and weather balloons. There, were, there was nothing Chinese about this. But, you know, I have to guard myself against falling into the trap of believing everything that Alex Jones supporters say to me. Right, because it can sound very real or realistic, but it it is simply often uh, meant to deliberately um, rail off rail you, right? To derail you. I mean, uh, because uh, if you start talking about 9/11 being an inside job uh, with planned explosives inside the buildings, because there was actually a maintenance of the elevator shafts in the two years prior to the right. So they, they claimed there was asbestos or something and then they start renewing the elevator shafts. But through the elevator shafts, you had access to all the interiors, you know, between the floors. There's like a crawl space between two floors often, right, in these big buildings. And so they are, were able to access all these crawl spaces through the elevator shafts. And that's how they did it. They they rigged the Twin Towers of, of Manhattan with explosives during the maintenance of the elevators and they planted all these thermite bombs or whatever they did inside and it was it was rigged an operation that would have taken at least one to two years including planning and actually rigging the buildings with bombs and then they were simply detonated they literally had a box with a button they pushed the button and the towers started coming down that's how they did it but once you start talking about this, you get Alex Jones talking about transgender frogs and aliens and all sorts of other things that just discredits your belief in the in the inside job story. You know. Wait a minute. I got to block some people. Yeah, derailing. And so. Seymour Hirsch was the one to report that the Americans had done Nord Stream. And I say, you know, using sonobuoys, they sent a signal to blow it up. And this is how they always do it. Right? Uh, 
you know, let me let me just go through the article. Let's see if I can find some uh, interesting things to talk about here. So America's political fears were real. I'm quoting the article. Putin, <clears throat> excuse me. Putin would now have an additional and much needed major source of income through the through the gas sales. And Germany and the rest of Western Europe would become addicted to low cost natural gas supplied by Russia. Yeah, you see, Europe and Russia were naturally getting closer to each other because of the share, because there's a mutual benefit to be gained. We get access to the cheap Russian resources in energy, gas, oil, whatever, and their resources. Wood, they got tons and tons of forests there. Wood and iron, you know, they say that the Russian economy is small compared to, say, Spain. But the Russian economy actually produces way more raw materials than do the European nations. And Europe, of course, has a large, po large population with a well-built infrastructure. And so, you know, you could see what was happening, right? Instead of McDonald's, we will have McRuski. Instead of Starbucks, we have uh, Ruski coffee, <laughs> Rus coffee, right? You see what was going to happen, right? We were going to have a, a Russian influence in Western Europe at the expense of the U.S., it was going to harm the U.S. economy, even though it was going to benefit Europeans, because for us, everything would have become cheaper. Yeah? In a relationship with Russia, the cost of living in Europe goes down. In a relationship with the USA, we are being destroyed and trampled upon. We are taxed to death. And then we have to send our men to die against Russia. Nothing will be left of us. You know, Europe is going, could potentially become you know, a wasteland, a wasted zone. You know, where was I? I was reading about the United States. Blah, blah, blah. Ostpolitik, Nord Stream 1. Yeah, so many Germans saw Nord Stream 1, the pipeline, as part of the deliverance of former Chancellor Willy Brandt. I think Willy Brandt was their last really intelligent German uh, Chancellor. You know, uh, the ones after that were all pro-American. Even Merkel was effectively pro-American. But although Merkel was still realistic, toward Russia. But now the one we have now, Olaf Scholz, my God, he's just an employee. He doesn't run Germany. He's an employee. He works for someone else, you know, bald head. You know, if you if you call Olaf Scholz a Glatzkopf in German, if you live in Germany, you can probably get arrested and go to jail for six months. So luckily I don't live in Germany. I can call him a Glatzkopf, you know. Someone says, I live in Malta and almost every day planes crisscross leaving trails. What's up with that? Yeah, it's probably just water vapor, dude. The difference with 50 years ago is the amount of air traffic. 50 years ago, there were very few planes crossing the skies. Compared to today, Europe is cluttered with air routes. So that's the real reason. It's probably nothing, nothing special. It's not like they're spraying agent orange all over europe to give us napalm burn effects now come on you know just a minute though you mentioned alex jones once and all the conspiracy nuts come into your comment section i don't consider myself a conspiracy theorist simply you know a conspiracy realist of course, there are conspiracies. It's just your job to figure them out, you know. Someone writes, they relate to the way I think. Well, thank you very much, you know. It means you're smart. <laughs> uh, my thoughts on the Palestine conflict, it's not my conflict. I'm pro-Europe, all right? I'm not for America. I'm not for Israel. I'm not for this or that or Russia or China. I'm for Europe and the European, our people living here. But I do support Europeans Europeans offshoots living in the colonies, as I say, in the U.S. and so on. I would support them very much, just not the leadership. The leadership is wrong. You know, maybe this is our aim to put the European people around the world under sort of European leadership. But this, you know, it means everything will change. Everything will have to change, you know. Let's see. You know, after the bombings, natural gas price of Nord Stream, natural gas prices surged with by 8%. And nowadays it's even more, right? It's like they also had to cut down. I think Germany effectively cut down 25% of it, of its gas use, but it may have uh, started using coal instead. So they're reopening the coal mines, you know. 
who will solve their problem first. America is going to support Israel until all Palestinians have been genocided under whatever excuse they can think of. They're going to do terrorism. They're going to do other things, right? But that's about it. Uh, in fact, this Christmas, you should expect a lot more Islamic terrorism in Europe because they're, they're going to blame it on Iran. It's not, you know... I, maybe I need to tell you the truth about this, right? <laughs> I don't know if you can understand this, but can you imagine Israeli secret servicemen who look like Iranians? Because many people in Israel look a bit brown, right? So you have brown-looking Israeli secret servicemen going to do terrorism in Europe, and then they blame Iran, right? Or they get mentally unstable people to do it for them. But whatever is going to happen in Europe, Europe is going to have terrorist attacks this Christmas because we need to be coaxed into supporting the war on terror against Iran and Russia and because Russia supports Iran and, and, and we have to be for Israel. You know, Nikki Haley, the presidential candidate in the USA, she said, we, if you don't support Israel, then you're an anti-Semite. <laughs> you know, if you, if you say things like that to European ears, we immediately zone out. Like, we were not going to listen to you anymore. We're not going to follow you because you're, we know that you are insane and unreasonable. To Europeans, you have to stay within the limits of reasonable discourse. You know, I, I exceed, I transgress these limits often. And that's how I know for sure. Europeans want you to stay reasonable. And if you're Nikki Haley, her, her real name Nimarata, because she's from India, you know, and you support Israel. Why? Because you're a Jew from India, a Jewess from India. You know, this is all so strange. You know, why don't we, you know, really overthrow the whole Western political system and, and build in Europe a new kind of aristocracy, a warrior a blood nobility, a warrior nobility who is willing to fight and win wars for their people, again, including for the people living outside of Europe, our own people, our European people, right? You know, <clears throat> whoever makes these decisions... You know, the way I see it is that the United States government is really a front for corporate America. And they and those corporate Americans, they have large shareholder families and they decide the U.S. foreign policy through their Council on Foreign Relations, probably. All right. I believe that members of the CFR or family members of members of the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations in the USA, they have supplied almost 80 years of presidential candidates and actual presidents in office. I believe only Donald Trump and Kennedy were, were different. Kennedy, they assassinated, and Trump, they're going to try to get him off the ballot so he can't even run for the second time. It was really a shocker for them that Trump won because Trump was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's not a member of what they call the Beltway clique. These are basically all the billionaires who vote Democrat in the USA. Right? Trump was a builder who makes money by building hotels and, and so on in the United States, right? And Mar-a-Lago, he wants to make things nice. That's what makes Trump, he's also a billionaire, but it makes him so very different from all the other American billionaires who make money off of like social media exploitation, off, off of development aid, meaning screwing Africans over, uh, climate change. That's how they make money. They make money basically by bullshitting people, whereas Trump makes money by actually building hotels that look nice, right? And that's the real difference, you know. Uh, thank you for sharing the live, you know. I don't know. Someone says the war, I suppose the war in Ireland has started, you know. So thoughts on European Muslims like Bosniaks and Albanians. You know, Albania used to be Christian. You know, I heard the story about Skander Bey and he fought the Turkish Ottomans and he renounced his Islamic faith to become Christian again. I wonder if that's a possibility for you. I don't know how, because I think I've been to Albania and I've been to um, Shkup, Shkup, yes, Shkup in Macedonia. And there you have like, in Macedonia, you have like a hill with a big Christian cross. And then there is the Islamic bazaar on the other side of town. Uh, and you could see clearly the difference. The Christian part was much, much, much nicer, much more well kept, clean. And the, the Islamic bazaar area was more like, oh, welcome to Kabul, <laughs> Kabul. You know, it's, it's so very different, you know. Yeah, Albania has always been on the frontier between Islam and Christianity. Yeah, this is, makes sense because they are close to Turkey, so they have a massive Islamic influence. That is understandable, but, you know, see yourself as the frontier then and think of Skander Bey. What would Skander Bey do? Skander Bey, what would he do? Maybe that is, uh, you know, 
the right thing to, to ask here. So Seymour Hirsch then later came with another article, uh, September 26, 2023, this year, just a month or two ago, right? One and a half month ago, titled in all caps, a year, a year of lying about Nord Stream. So the Biden administration has acknowledged neither its responsibility for the pipeline bombing nor the purpose of the sabotage, but it's easy to figure these things out. It's to save the U.S. economy so they could start selling their own American LNG gas to Germany and Europeans at extortionate wartime prices. That's what they did, you know. Here, the article is way too long for me to read it. Uh, I suppose, let's see if I can find some some sound bites here and there, you know. Well, either way, it's just Seymour Hirsch goes through this article published on his Substack. Uh, it's for paid subscribers. Now, I didn't pay for it, so I found a copy of the article elsewhere. And, uh, you know, the Biden administration, he writes, blew up the pipelines, but the action had little to do with winning or stopping the war in Ukraine. It resulted from fears in the White House that Germany would waver and turn on turn on the flow of Russian gas. So the Americans are terrified of the prospect of Germany siding with Russia because it would make Europe so much stronger and and more independent from the U.S. economy. Uh, if, in fact, like I said, the whole bombing is the beginning of the end of the relationship between Europe and the U.S. And it may have been the bombings of Nord Stream may have actually been a self-fulfilling prophecy by by bombing Nord Stream, right? By bombing Nord Stream, the U.S. is going to get what it didn't want. They did not want Europe to to uh, work more closely with the Russian economy, right? And I think that is exactly what is going to happen. The Hyksos were Aryans. I've heard another theory that the Hyksos were Jews. The Hyksos of Egypt, you know. This flag here is the logo of my podcast. It is Odin's raven flying up into the wind toward victory. It's also a Danish youth flag, but the flames are my own design. The Vikings would have a triangular version of this flag with the bird in the corner, and that flag would, ha would hang or fly from the front or the back of their Viking boats where you have the dragon's head, right? And then I found, you know, despite all this, there there are people who were able to track you have these websites called F flight radar 24 and um, and you can s track ships and uh, i think uh, well airplanes of course but there's also a, a version of it for ship travel and they actually were able to track uh, the american aircraft without a call sign meaning their black box was switched off right and they were able to fly under the radar but uh, their flight was actually still recorded on Flight Radar 24, and someone was able to actually pinpoint the exact plane. Let me see if I click on it. And they even know it was a Boeing P-8A Poseidon plane. That is the one that triggered the sauna boys in the Baltic Sea. That is how they, uh, it's an American aircraft, the Poseidon Bay, Boeing, and Boeing was involved in it. No, not the company. But one of their aircraft was involved in, uh, in blowing up Nord Stream by activating the Sono Boy. Yeah. And, and someone was able to, to track this entire, uh, and they see even that this airplane, after it was done uh, messing with, uh, messing with, uh, with the Sono Boy, it actually refueled over Germany. In fact, let me look closely at it. Uh, is east, yeah, east of Berlin, but still in Germany, in northeastern Germany, closer to Poland. The plane that activated the sauna buoy that blew up the Nord Stream actually refueled over Germany from a German aircraft, which basically means that the German secret services and the German military were themselves involved also in bombing Nord Stream. This is also unforgivable. Anyway. I think I'm done talking about Nord Stream. So let me see. Oh, I've been talking for 50 minutes now. So um, why not do a tiny little, tiny little intermezzo? Uh, I made a new. I, you know, some of you know that I also produce music once in a while. So I produced this song. It's going to be out soon. It's not on Spotify yet, but it's on YouTube already. Hear the ocean by my artist named the JMK. So I thought I'll just play this for a little bit. 
Uh, let's see. I hope the music isn't too loud. I hear the sound in the ocean. It called me from the bottom. I hear a child very emotional. I feel the power of the caution. I hear the sound from the ocean. It's in the back of my head. Bring it my party. It wants to get out. It is calling me. What a beautiful sound of your love. That's uh, that's the end of the song. Uh, it's called uh, "Hear the Ocean" by the JMK. It's on it's on YouTube now, and um, it's supposed to be on Spotify soon as well. But uh, I'll, it, this process takes a little time. 
Um, so if you want to, if you like my music, I have a Spotify called The JMK. I'm a verified artist there. You can find all my songs there. Uh, I'm getting better and better at making music. Like this one is pretty good, I think. So I'm going to keep making music uh, for some time now. So someone asked me, uh, you know, what will the world be like in 10 years? I, you know, let me rephrase that. Instead of telling you what it will be like in 10 years, how, how about I tell you what I want it to be in 10 years? I want Europe to be independent just 10 years from now. That we will have a new leadership in Europe, right? A new, someone willing to build a new aristocracy of competent people. The aristocracy means rule of the best. That we have actual competent, driven people, smart people who have a good vision for what needs to be done in Europe. And the first thing we do is we make Europe strong again. We make Europe a sort of Spartan warrior state. Right. We make ourselves independent from the U.S. economy, <clears throat> but not the bitch of Russia either. We will dominate Russia. Right. Whether you like it or not, Russia has 130 million people drinking vodka every day. We in Europe, we can do better than that. Right. We will close the borders because Europe is overcrowded and overpopulated. We need to cut the fat, make Europe lean and lean and mobile and flexible again so that we can start doing some far more interesting things like, I don't know, completely re reworking the idea of our civilization and definitely cutting loose from the materialism and from the money cult of Mammon, the god Mammon, you know. So that's my point, you know. How will it, how will it affect us Europeans when the Chinese take over? We have different values. So far, I think the Chinese... Uh, yeah, they love the idea of a rules-based order. Uh, Xi Jinping also announced his version of the rules-based order as opposed to the one coming out of the West. So, yeah, the Chinese are going to stay very different. And that's why we in Europe, we do not need their numbers. If China has, or if the Asian sphere has five or six billion people in it, we in Europe need to specialize in being lean and mean and flexible and mobile, right? Rather than stuck on, in, in rice paddies. We don't want to be like that. Let them be like that, but we can't be like that, you know? You know, Europe is the world. It can lead again. Yes, I hope so. I, I believe Europe can take on a leadership role in the world if we make it very clear to everybody that there is no universal truth there's no universal humanity we're all different and those difference those differences need to be respected and that is the real discrimination i feel that if you don't respect that africans chinese americans and europeans that we're all really different right then you're denying you know who we really are and that's really racist what are good think tanks according to you? Oh, I found one recently, but I probably forgot the name. Uh, no, I can't, I can't remember it. There was one in the United States that was really, really smart and they were really onto something, but I don't, uh, wait, I can probably Google it for you because I remember the event where they spoke and I'll, I'll figure one out, wait. Just a minute. I'm going to look up the one think tank that I think is actually doing the right thing. Because I, I remember they had an event. Here, I got the event website. And what were they called? You know? Uh, blah, blah, blah. When was this? This was in October, I think. Or before that, possibly. No, 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 no. Not that one, even before that. Maybe it was in uh, September then. Let's see, book launch. I remember it was a book launch here. Yeah. Not that one. No, it came after that one. I don't know. I don't know if it's on here. Yeah? The, uh, ah, yeah. Okay, wait. Here, the guy was called James Poulos. Polos. James Polos, and then... He works for the, the Claremont Institute. That's the one. I'll type it out for you. Finally, I found it. Claremont Institute. That's one I think. It's a Christian institute. But th I think they are definitely the guy who wrote the book, James Poulos. He wrote a book for that institute as well. You might want to read it. Uh, he really goes against this idea of transhumanism and uh, and so on. And the, you know, the diffusion of man with technology. They're very different about this. And I think Claremont Institute is probably something I can kind of support, you know. 
though you you just have to look look for what they're really doing i think they're on the right track this is something i might i'm going to look into it myself even more now so i think they may be uh, doing what was necessary anyway you know yeah i was baptized roman catholic so that, that means you're christian i mean i grew up in a christian country and a christian went to a christian primary school i mean what do you expect you know you know that's because europeans didn't simply they always say that all christianity is a uh, middle eastern jewish religion but of course european christianity carries the european value system that was simply introduced back into catholicism mostly right well look at these things i like the german nature german nature is beautiful in the eastern germany you have these hiking trails and parks and forests and so on that's very beautiful yeah yeah okay i'm gonna this is the end of this show if you want to keep following me uh let's see you can go to my youtube at the great johannes wait let me oh all right all right uh and you can go to my uh, twitter at johannes mkx or my telegram at johannes mk yeah, i've got different usernames on these platforms because some names are no longer available yeah i have twitter so twitter is at johannes mkx let me see if i can play it again here that one and let's see i also have uh, my Substack. go to my Substack www.jmk.info you can subscribe there the flag behind me is my logo it's a danish it's odin's raven flying up into the wind toward victory and it's similar to a viking flag but mine my my flames are my own design that's all all right uh yep yeah, that's it all right see you next time